Hello, in this video we're going to look at Final Zero from the Protostar Binary Exploitation series. So if you haven't seen the previous videos, Protostar is essentially a set of 32-bit binaries for Debian Linux that all have some sort of vulnerability uh, related to memory corruption. So for example, we have seen in stack 0 through stack 5 or 6, that buffer overflows on the stack can uh, allow for arbitrary code execution and as well as uh, the ability to write arbitrary values to any address in memory. We have also seen that format strings give us also write primitives to uh, arbitrary addresses in memory. We haven't looked at any heap so far uh, and uh, the reason for that is actually because the vulnerabilities in these heap challenges are not too practical uh, for later versions of libc. So currently the version of libc is, I believe, 2.32. At least it's 2.31. And a lot of the uh, vulnerabilities that we see uh, in these heap challenges are actually mitigated, uh, particularly uh, functionality around the unlink macro. And we also haven't looked at any net, and the reason for that is just because net is, I mean, in my opinion, it's pretty straightforward. It's something that, you know, you just need to learn a couple of the, uh, of the library functionalities, especially around creating uh, child processes, especially daemons, and then waiting for a connection. Everything else is essentially just the same as if we were running the program ourselves. Okay, so in, in this video, we're going to look at final zero. So this is considered a kind of a cumulative exercise, I guess you could say, uh, involving network programming and stack overflow. So this is, it, this is at heart a stack problem. Uh, again, there's some network in here, but really the vulnerability has nothing to do with the fact that we are doing this over a network. So let's take a look at the source code briefly. Uh, here is main. Essentially in main, we set up the child process, and then we tie standard in, standard out, standard error to that process. So essentially you can see from this that, you know, if we can get shell by interacting with this child, then essentially we have shell. There's really nothing else to it, right? So the interesting part of this function is in get username. Uh, so get username looks like it's supposed to return a character pointer, in other words, a string. And then that is printed out here uh, at the bottom, no such user. Okay, so let's see how get username is implemented. So first, a stack buffer of size 512 is allocated. And we set this buffer uh, contents all to zero. And then we call gets on this buffer. So already the vulnerability is clear. There's a gets here. So uh, there's possibility for stack overflow. And uh, after we get the input from the user, we strip off the new line characters by looking for the first instance of uh, both the new line and the carriage return. So hex A and hex D here in ASCII. And then we set those values to zero if they are, uh, are non-null. In other words, if the buffer contains these characters, which they should because uh, gets here will keep on reading until, uh, until it detects a new line uh, character. So after the string is terminated at the new line characters, then we convert everything to uppercase. So the comment here is actually misleading because uh, we see down here that we are just doing two upper on each uh, character in the buffer. So essentially what this does is if we look here, man to upper, see that if C is a lowercase letter, right, to upper return that's uppercase equivalent. So what this means for us is that uh, we are not able to input any lowercase characters before the first carriage return. Um, 
because if we did, then it would just simply be translated to the uppercase. Now, if the character is not a lowercase character, in other words, if it's an uppercase character or if it's not an alphabetic character to begin with, then the function just returns the input byte. Okay, so it's very straightforward, uh, nothing to it there. So, so this is really not a big problem for us. Then finally, the string is duplicated and returned via stirred up. Now, if you're not familiar with stirred up, essentially what it does is it allocates some space on the heap that will be sufficient to contain the length of the string. And then it copies the string into that uh, heap chunk and then returns an address to that chunk. That's all it does. It's very straightforward. Uh, and this is returned to the caller main. And then main just prints no such user uh, person s. Okay, so this is all very straightforward. Uh, again, there's nothing too special about this. The fact that uh, there's a gets call means that there's a um, buffer overflow vulnerability. But to see if we can actually easily exploit this, let's go ahead and copy the actual binary from the uh, from the image onto our local machine. So again, we use VirtualBox, and uh, we can set up a port forwarding here under network settings, go to advanced port forwarding. And we can see here that I have a rule set up here that forwards this 10.02.15.22 over to 127.001 port 2222. So we can just connect to here. Okay, so let's go ahead and copy this binary from this uh, instance over to our terminal and then we will open it with IDA. Okay, let's go ahead and do that. So the way we do that is SCP port 2222 user at 127.001, which is exactly what we set the port forwarding to. And then we're going to go to opt protostar bin and final zero. We're gonna copy that just to our local directory, final zero. Password for user is just user and we can see that we have the file now. Okay, so the first thing we can do is just look at what this file is. So we can see here that it's a 32-bit uh, executable and linkable uh, Linux binary, pretty much what we expected here. And let's also run checksec on final zero. And this from here, it shows us that there are pretty much no protections on this binary. We can see that there is no uh, NX, which means that the stack is executable. In other words, if we load shellcode on stack, we can um, conceivably return to it. Uh, there's no cannery, so that means that we can easily overflow buffers on the stack. There's no PIE or position independent execution, which means that we know the address of our text segment as well as the BSS and any other thing we might need to know. And of course, there's W. RWX, of course, stack is one of these such segments where we can read, write, and execute. And as well as rel row, so there's no rel row, which means that if we so uh, desired, we could overwrite an address on the global offset table. So a lot of different routes for exploitation here. The intended solution, I believe, is to write shell code. Um, based on this hint here. But in this video, I want to go a route that I've explored rather frequently in some of the other CTF video write-ups that I've done on this channel, which is return-oriented programming, and in particular, rep to libc. So we're going to return to libc to get our shell. OK, so let's figure out how we're going to exploit this. Again, we're going to open the binary in IDA to kind of gain some more information about this. So let's open in IDA. OK, so now that IDA has looked at this binary, we can uh, we can see that this is main. Main is very similar to what we saw on the uh, in the source code. Right, there's nothing that we didn't expect here. And get username is here. This is the vulnerable function, and we can see there's a call to gets and uh, on this as here. So uh, matching this with the source, I believe the source calls this buffer, and var 10, I believe is q, 
and for C, I believe is uh, it's just a dummy variable for an iterator. And as we go through here, we can see, first of all, we have gets, and then we terminate any new line characters here. We replace it with zero, null by terminator. And then after that, we go through the whole string, we loop through and we check, uh, we, we call two upper on every single character in the string. Okay, so that's pretty much what we uh, solve in the source code. So how are we going to exploit this? Again, I'm going to use rectlibc. There are many ways to do this. You can also write shell code, but I feel like rectlibc is probably the easiest way. So let's do a ROP exploit. So, so usually, right, when we're exploiting these kinds of binaries, we don't actually get to see what happens from the uh, from the server side, right, the root side. So what we're going to do is go ahead and uh, get this process started up in root and see what's happening. So we're going to SSH to root at 127.0.0.1 and port 2222. The root password is god mode. So again, uh, we're trying to exploit this. So obviously, whatever goes on over here, we shouldn't be able to control except for just starting up this process. But this is also helpful for us because we can see what's actually going on uh, as we run this process. So let's go to opt proto star bin. And we can see all our files here. Uh, we're going to run this one, final zero. So let's just do S trace and we're going to follow child final zero. Okay, so as we do this, we can see that when we try to run this, the address is already in use. And this will happen if the process is already, of course, running. So let's look at PS aux to see uh, what is going on here. And we can see that final zero has indeed already been started some time. So let's go ahead and kill that process, 2060, and try the S trace again. Okay, so this time we can see that it is now waiting for a connection. And before this happens, we can see some uh, syscalls here. First of all, we have a clone. This clones that original process, right? And then this child process now waits, uh, sets up all of the file descriptors and ties them to the socket. And then we have, we're essentially just waiting now for an, a connection. Okay, so this is pretty much what we expect. Again, uh, as a user, we're not able to see what happens here, right? We are only able to uh, interact with the user um, account. So let's go ahead and just SSH to user to now start preparing our exploit. So port 2222, user's password is user. And now we can see from our ID that we are user, right, instead of root. But everything we're going to do is it's going to be over here in terms of our exploit. Okay, so uh, now we're just, let's start up the bash shell first. And then let's create an exploit for final zero. Okay, so this is our exploit. It's going to be a Python uh, script. And the first thing I want to do is obviously just to connect to this process in the first place, right? And to do that is very easy because we know this is just a regular old TCP port. And the port number is 2995. So that's very easy for us to do in Python. We can use socket here. Um, and let's just create a socket. So socket.socket. .socket. And we're going to use AFINet and uh, sock stream here. Okay. And now we can actually connect to our uh, server which of course is at localhost and the port is 2995. Okay. And yeah, and we can also just set a timeout here of uh, two. Basically, if anything waits for longer than two seconds, then we'll just kill the entire process. Okay, so uh, that's all we need to do here. Uh, to test that this is working, we can just send something. Let's just send hello world. And we will print out what we get back. So s.receive, and we'll receive 4,096 uh, bytes here. So as we write that, 
uh, let's keep an eye on the actual uh, serving process and we can run python final zero dot python and we can see from here that uh, the the process heard us right it, it received all this data and then it wrote uh, no such user hello world which is exactly what we expected right that's uh, what we saw in the source code okay so that's good and everything but now we would like to get a shell so how do we get a shell so again we have to exploit this gets vulnerability and get username and through rectlibc uh, we want to first of all leak the address of libc and then we want to return to for example uh, exec ve or perhaps system right depending on what we're looking for okay so uh let's look at what the stack looks like first so here's what the stack looks like in git username. So it's pretty straightforward. Here we have the buffer at EBP minus hex 210, as we have seen in our IDA dump here, we can see that. And then we have two local variables at uh, EBP minus hex 10 and EBP minus hex C. Then we have an eight byte padding area between this uh, iterator variable and the top of the frame. At the top of the frame, of course, we have the EBP, saved EBP from main. And then one word uh, beyond that, we have the return address where we're going to return to in main after we uh, finish with get username. So of course, because of gets, all of this is now free game to us. We can overwrite essentially anything we want to. And so the first thing we're going to do is obtain a libc leak. So to leak libc, we need a function that will kind of print something for us. So for example, puts or printf. And of course, those are very common, like any program that, you know, uh, has some sort of output will have these functions. So we just have to look for those. In this case, there's no puts, doesn't look like, but there is a printf here. So the address of printf is 804bac. So imagine... Now, if instead of returning to main, we return instead to jump printf. Let's make this a little bit smaller. And that is, okay. And the, the address is 08048BAC, as we can see here. So if we overwrite this return address, essentially now we're going to base, uh, to print, we're going to jump to printf instead of returning to main, right? We're going to control code execution here. Now for CDBP, all this stuff, it doesn't really matter what we put. We can put basically anything, uh, you know, to make this a little bit more organized, we can just put like a constant like dead beef here so that we can recognize it. Okay, so uh, now we need to pass printf some arguments. Now remember in 32-bit, uh, we don't pass arguments via registers as we do in 64-bit, but rather on the stack, which actually makes life a little bit easier for us because instead of uh, having to find gadgets that pop into registers, we can just directly load our arguments onto the stack. And in this case, whenever we return to printf, remember that printf will see this uh, value here at the EBP plus eight, this is going to uh, be the return address from printf, right? Because printf doesn't know that it was returned to, it thought that it was called. And in the case that it is called, then this needs to basically uh, contain that return address. Uh, so this value, we can make anything we want to, but because we need to actually submit a second payload after we leak, the best idea for this is just simply to return back to get username. So this function here. So 0804975A is where we're going to go. Nine seven five A, I believe, is what it was. And let me just do this. Okay. All right. 
So that's what we're going to return to after. And then the first argument on uh, the first argument to printf will be actually right under this. Okay, so what are we going to pass to printf? Well, a good idea would just be to pass, uh, well, we need to leak libc, so we need to get a, uh, a address from libc. In this case, let's just use printf. Printf is in libc. In this case, got, uh, the got address of printf is 0804 adf4. So we can put printf dot 0804 adf4. Okay, so if we do this now, what will happen is the program will print out some gibberish, right? But that gibberish is actually very useful to us because it will contain the address of our uh, of the actual printf, which will then give us the address of the libc base, which we can then use to calculate the you know address of system and uh, bin sh and whatnot, so that we can get a shell. So let's go ahead and implement this first part and go ahead and see if we can get something out of it. So let's go to our user now and let's vim final zero dot pi. Okay, so instead of this, we can go ahead and just comment this out. It's not important to us. Let's first, oh, let's import struct so that we can uh, encode these constants a little bit easier. So let's first define some constants. So jump to printf is going to be this guy. Oops. Okay. Uh, then we have get username is going to be this guy here. And then we have printf at the global offset table, which is this guy here. Okay, so now we have those. And let's go ahead and submit this first payload. So we're going to do, uh, let's go ahead and define a lambda. Um, hmm. uh, let's do like this. Okay, so We're going to do un32 equals lambda of i. And what it's going to be is it's going to return struct.pack pack a little Indian uh, unsigned integer, which is four bytes. And it's going to do i. Okay, so that's essentially what it's going to do. And now let's do s.send. So we first got to fill up the buffer all the way to the saved EBP. So let's just do 210. Uh, it doesn't matter what we put here. We'll just put one, right? It doesn't matter. Uh, and then we're going to do, uh, let's do uint32 hex dead beef for the EBP. And then we're just going to do uh, Jump printf get username and printf at got. Okay, and of course we need to terminate this or end this with a new line. And that is pretty much all we need, I think. Okay, so now that we have this. Let's see if we can go ahead and receive. So uh, let's just print what we get. Let's receive. Let's do 4096. We actually won't need that much, but um, let's let's just try it anyway. All right. So let's open up this guy here so we can see as it uh, happens and do Python. Okay. So uh, if you look here, what we, what we got returned is a bunch of gibberish, just like we said. But this is not gibberish. This contains the address of printf, which we can now use to deduce the address of libc without even knowing, right? Uh, without debugging it in uh, in this mode here. But you can actually see from here that it wrote, uh, and here's the data specifically that it wrote. Um, and then notice that also that we get a segmentation fault. Uh, afterwards, because 
you know, essentially what we put here, it's going to return, trying to return to some garbage stuff that we overwrote. Okay. So now that we can capture that, let's go ahead and make some sense of this. So, so we have UN32. Let's do, um, let's do decode. 32, we're going to do this lambda, it's going to be lambda of, uh, let's do bytes, and we're going to do struct.unpack little Indian, and it's going to be Bs, and we're just going to get the first one. Okay, so now uh, we're going to do, uh, let's see, so we're going to get the actual address of printf is going to be decode 32, and we just want to read four bytes from our socket. So s dot read four. Now let's print printf. And let's see what it looks like. Okay, so we're gonna run this again. Oh, my bad it should be receive. Okay, so now that we interpret this, we can see printf is at this address, hex b7 edd f90. So you can see this b7 here should remind you of some of the earlier protostar challenges that we've done in 32-bit uh, binaries where this is definitely looking like a libc address. So now that we have the address of printf, we need to find what is the base of libc. And to do that, we actually need the libc itself. So a priori, we don't really know what it could be. Uh, there are ways to find out what it is based on whatever the address is. But because we have access to this machine, we can just simply pull it from lib. So let's go to lib and see what kind of libc is running here. So going up, we can see that there is libc 2.11. So this is a really old libc, of course, because it's I mean obviously 32-bit, but uh, we can see that that is the version of libc. And to actually play around with it, we can copy this to our machine just like we did for the actual binary and take a look at different offsets. So let's exit from here. And let's SCP from port 2222, uh, user at 127.0.0.1, lib, and here. And we're going to just copy it to libc 2.11.so. Okay, and we're going to, okay, there we go. So now we can see that we also have libc 2.11. Okay, so let's open that in IDA and see what's going on. So here we are, and we're going to open with interactive disassembler. So this will take a little while because it is a large binary. But once it's done, we can see where printf is located. OK, so it's done analyzing. Let's go to printf. OK, so here is the function for printf. We can see that it is at address offset 46F90. Now, if we compare that to what we saw earlier, Where was that? Here we go, B789, here we go. We can see that the last three nibble here is F90, which exactly matches the offset here, which means that we're pretty confident that this is the an actual printf address. And we can use this to calculate the base address of libc. Okay, so let's now vim uh, our final zero dot python. And we're going to load some more constants here. So printf uh, offset in libc is x46f90. Now, of course, to get the actual shell, we can do something like get um, system. We can do like a system like bin sh like this, right? That's probably the easiest way. If we do exec ve, then we have to well, it's, it's about the same. We have to have some additional arguments here that we can easily just set to zero. 
But system bin sh is easy and let's just do it like this. So we have to find the system offset in libc and we also need to find a string bin sh, which is also in libc. So for system, we can just go to system. Here's system, we can see that its offset is 38fb0. So let's go ahead and put that here, 38fb0. And then for the bin sh, uh, we can search for text and we can look for bin sh. And after a while, we should see, okay, in the read only data here, we can see now bin sh and we can put that into our offsets. So 11f, 3bf. Okay, so now we have all our offsets. So essentially we can know what these are because we can just simply add them to the base of libc. So to find libc base, we can take our printf and subtract the printf offset in libc. That will give us the base. And now to for our actual payload, we will send. So remember, this one will return to get username. So it's still waiting for our input here. Let's do the same overflow. But this time, instead of returning to jump printf, we're going to go directly to system. Okay, so let's just do system. And this is directly in libc. So we don't know what the address is here, but we can calculate it. And for the return, it doesn't really matter what we put here. We can just put it as get username. This only affects what happens whenever we return from this uh, called system, of course. Um, so, and then the argument to system is not gonna be printf at GOT, but rather it's gonna be the address of NSH. The address of bin sh is also unknown at the beginning, but we will calculate this. So uh, from here, now ellipse base, we can calculate system. Ellipse base plus system offset in libc, and then bin sh, same here, libc base. Now we have pretty much everything uh, we need. So let's again put dead beef there. Let's do system here. Uh, yeah, we can get username again. Again, this part doesn't matter. It just determines what happens after you return from system, but we just need shell. So um, that's kind of irrelevant for us. Then we can do bin sh. And then we just add a new line here. Okay, so at this point, what, hap well, what happened is the program, right, it's still, uh, it went back to a username. It's going to run through this. And when it returns, it's going to return and execute a shell, bin sh. So in order to for us to capture this shell and actually interact with it, we need to finally set up an interactive shell. So in in bare bones Python like this, there uh, there actually is a way to do it, um, but you have to use select, basically kind of wait for, because right now you're essentially waiting for both the input from our shell and also the shell on the server. Now with other tools like pwn tools, um, other libraries, you can do this much uh, in a much easier way, but this is how you would do it if you were just stuck with regular old uh, vanilla Python, right? With no additional libraries. Okay, so, um, and, and again, we're doing this because of course we're doing this on our uh, Debian machine here, which really doesn't have anything uh, for us to use. So uh, what we're gonna do is set up a socket list. Basically, this is everything that is, uh, that the program is going to, uh, that Python's gonna listen to. And we're also gonna import sys so that we can specify standard in. So sys.standard in, and then we're also gonna put s. So essentially it's a two-way communication between standard in and s. And let's set a flag variable here. And while true, so this will run essentially until done is uh, true. We're going to 
I use select. So select dot select and socket list and empty list here. So what this will do is basically this is these are the read, write, and error streams, and select will return whenever there is something uh, when there is an update in one of these streams. Uh, that's essentially what uh, will happen. So we can loop through uh, all of our everything in ours here, and we can check where it's coming from. So if it's coming from the socket, that means that we have some data available there. And in that case, we will read that data. So let's just, uh, let's receive 4096. Okay, and then uh, let's say if not, then we'll just set uh, done to true and then we will break out of this, right? Uh, and then otherwise, we will go ahead and print whatever we read. Okay, then if uh, ours is equal to our sys.standard in, then we will, that means that we're, we sent something to standard in that can be sent now to the, uh, the socket. And in this case, we're just going to get some raw input here. And we're going to, of course, append a new line to, uh, to essentially flush the buffer uh, on the socket side. And then, yeah, and then if there's otherwise, we're just going to raise uh, exception. Uh, and unknown. All right, and then after all this happens, we're gonna check done. And if done, we're just gonna break out of this while loop and that's pretty much it. Okay, so now let's see if we can get a shell here. We're gonna keep this open as usual. Let's run Python final zero dot pi. Oh, uh, okay, yeah. There should be bin sh. There we go, let's try now. Okay, so looking at here, we are now waiting, looks like we're waiting for input, but let's see over here what happened. You can see that 2262 started a process exec v bin sh. Okay, so that's good. So let's see if we can actually read something. Oh, uh, and we got an exception for unknown. So let's see what happened here. Okay, so maybe that was, oh, that's right, that's right, that's not, so this will not be standard in actually. Uh, let's just change this here to else. That would not make sense there. Uh, it cannot be, RSA will not be standard in. Okay. okay. Okay, and it looks like we have a shell here. So we can now look at the ID and we can see now that we are root, our UID is zero. So we are root. And indeed that's gonna be the case here. Okay, so um, yeah, that's essentially the exploit. Uh, again, a little bit, uh, cool because we can see from the server side what's going on um, and you know in real ctf challenges you probably will be given the libc in this case we just took it from the the server um, and yeah that's pretty much uh everything uh Again, it's very good exercise to try this with shell code as well, but in our case, it was very straightforward. We just leaked the address of libc here um, and then uh, basically did system bin sh over here. 
So I hope that was helpful. I hope you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next video.